cool. So we're going to continue where we left off on uh, Wednesday. So on Wednesday, we talked about some pretty gross stuff, right? We were talking about necrosis, different types of gangrene, some really uh, unsightly conditions that unfortunately happen to some people. Um, and today we're going to talk about some more stuff that's kind of interesting as well. So uh, not as gross, like things involving fluid dynamics, but definitely things that are really important, things that you will actually see in a clinical setting. But to finish up with the, the first part of uh, module one here, let's first talk about the inflammatory response. Most of you guys took microbiology before, right? Most of you. Okay, cool. So this is just like a recap and a review of stuff that you were exposed to during micro. So in microbiology, of course, you're dealing with infectious agents, bacteria, viruses, etc. And in pathology, you're going to see similar types of uh, reactions to other types of diseases as well. Right? So the cardinal signs of inflammation, there's four. Right? These are going to be the major four cardinal signs. And the fifth one sometimes happens, but not always. So if you speak Spanish or Portuguese, uh, a lot of these words are very similar. Right? Calor, that's hot. Dolor, pain. Uh, rubor, not really in Spanish. I don't think it's in Spanish. Do you speak Spanish, rubor? It's not in Portuguese either. I speak Portuguese. So. But the first two, yes. Tumor. That's Latin, but the tumor. Think about tumor, right? So you're increasing in size, right? And then functionalese, right? So that's going to be loss of function. So sometimes you get that fifth one, but not always. The main mediators that are going to be involved in that are going to be different types of cytokines. Cyt what are cytokines? They're more, more basic than that. Cytokines are things that are released by cells so that cells can communicate with each other, right? So that's what cytokines are, and oftentimes they're inflammatory. Right, so inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor. Those are going to be the major ones that are important for the purpose of this class. There's a bunch of other cytokines, but don't worry about those yet. Those, you can worry about those when you get to med school. But the, for the purpose of this class, IL-1, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor, TNF, those are the major ones that are super important, especially for the production of the fever response. Okay? Other ones that are important, histamine. That's super important. Right? What's histamine released by? And what else? Yeah, eosinophils and mast cells are going to be the major cells that do that, right? <clears throat> no, not eosinophils, basophils. Yeah, eosinophils are associated with parasitic infections. Yeah, so if you get a spike in eosinophils, you probably have a tapeworm or something like that, a helminth, maybe a liver fluke. So yeah, basophils are what release histamine. Uh, cool, nothing else here that's important. So these are some of the other things that are going to be important, but, you know, not as important, but pretty important. Nitrous oxide that allows for vasodilation, right? As you release histamine and you vasodilate, that's going to increase vascular permeability. Why do you want to actually have vascular permeability? Yeah. Yeah, so your leukocytes can actually go to the site of the infection or... Yeah, mostly for the site of the infection, so that they can actually go in there and kill whatever the infectious agent is. Or if there's debris, maybe like necrosis is taking place, or there's like those blebs that I was talking about the other day with regard to apoptosis, then phagocytes can go there and they can start, you know, gobbling up all the debris that's accumulating in those tissues. Um, but then let's see what else here. Prostaglandins. So prostaglandins are going to be associated with like paracrine type of function. You guys remember endocrine versus paracrine? So endocrine is what? It's involving hormones, right? Bloodstream, yes. So it's going to be one organ sending a hormone so that it can target another organ far away in the body, right? The HPO axis, great example of that, right? The hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and then a target organ, whether it's the thyroid, maybe the adrenal glands, etc. Paracrine is local, right? It's going to be involving... Uh, signals are sent out locally to adjacent cells. And prostaglandins and leukotrienes are going to be really important in that. Prostaglandins are going to be associated with pain and fever. You guys are familiar with NSAIDs, right? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories mostly are engaging, uh, operating on uh, cyclooxygenase. So they're COX-1, COX-2 inhibitors. So aspirins, ibuprofen, all those types of drugs 
are going to inhibit cyclooxygenase. They're going to inhibit the production of prostaglandins. They're going to reduce pain. They're going to reduce fever. That's why when you get sick and you're like feeling febrile, or if you have a headache after a really bad hangover, you can take ibuprofen, and that's going to reduce prostaglandin release, right? Uh, what else we got here? Platelet aggregating factor, that's going to be really important for you know, uh, vasodilation and all that. But the main ones are going to be cytokines, IL-1, IL-6, and TNF. Uh, and those are going to be really important for uh, pain, fever, and all of that. Okay, So those are going to be some of the major mediators of pain, fever, and other cellular responses to uh, cell insult. Um, pain, the definition, it's going to be unpleasant sensations, right? And remember that pain is going to be extremely subjective. It's going to differ from person to person. Some people have a higher tolerance. Some people have a lower tolerance. Um, in terms of classification of pain, right? So some people just have like an acute uh, insult, right? So it would be You'll have the pain that happens right away versus chronic, right? Some people get chronic pain. Why is chronic pain such an issue nowadays? Huh? Yeah, opioids, exactly. So what happens with a lot of, what's the age demographic for a lot of people who, who get hooked on opioids? Yeah, mid-50s. It's often like older dudes who maybe got into a car accident. Guys generally tend to experience uh, trauma more than females for whatever reasons because we're reckless, I guess. Um, or sometimes it's job related. They might get some sort of injury at, on the job. And so what happens? Guy gets into, uh, maybe he was lifting something heavy at work and then he damages his back. Maybe he gets, you know, some sort of like vertebral issue. Um, now he's experiencing pain. So he goes to his doctor. Doctor gives him opioids. And now he's like starting to take opioids and then he might develop a uh, dependency on opioids. Then what happens when the doctor stops prescribing opioids, he still wants to take the opioids, he's going to find them elsewhere. So that's kind of what's resulted in the current uh, opioid crisis. So chronic pain is definitely important. Um, some of you guys might even go off and do pain management. That's a whole entire subset of, of medicine. Uh, there's lots of doctors who do that. It's not just using opioids. You can use other things too. Some people do nerve ligation uh, or uh, nerve ablation. Sorry, ligation means to reconnect. They'll do nerve ablation. So if a person experiences pain, you can actually go in there and cut the nerves. So a good example of that would be a person with, uh, uh, what's it called, multiple sclerosis, where they had trigeminal neuralgia. It's one of the most painful things out there. When people have trigeminal neuralgia of the trigeminal nerve, you can take things like gabapentin or like nerve blockers, but generally the best treatment is going in there and just cutting the trigeminal nerves that are affected you can stop the pain. So chronic pain management is a really important thing in medicine. Um, <clears throat> nociceptive versus non-nociceptive. Don't really worry about that so much. Nociceptive, that's going to involve like visceral versus somatic. And then you also have neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain is uh, especially important when it comes to like diabetes patients because over time they develop uh, diabetic neuropathy, which results in all sorts of terrible consequences, including what? What's something that diabetics get quite often? Huh? Yeah, you can get uh, retinopathy and stuff like that, but like your feet? Yeah, you get neuropathy, which can result in what? Huh? Loss in cessation, which can result in what? Amputation. There you go. So you get like a little nick, you get injured, that injury gets infected, and the person doesn't even know it. Once that infection gets to the bone, you get osteomyelitis. The treatment for osteomyelitis is amputation. Uh, I had a friend as a physician. He's a podiatrist. And he jokingly says that part of his job is to make people shorter. <laughs> so <laughs> very dark humor. Uh, anyways, so yeah, pain can be localized, generalized, right? Uh, if you have like appendix, things like that, it's going to be kind of like in a general area of right lower quadrant. Or pain can radiate, right? So pain that radiates is really important because it can be a signal of some sort of underlying issue with an organ, right? One of the most important ones is the heart. If a person has an MI, one of the hallmarks is crushing chest pain. They'll sometimes describe it as a person sitting on their chest. What's up?
Yeah. Yeah. So women do present a little bit differently. That it probably has to do again with pain threshold. Because guys are you're like, ah, it hurts, right? And women's like, it doesn't really hurt as much, but they'll start getting like loss of breath, right? Then they'll start getting some of that pain that like radiates. So that's something to look out after, uh, look out for for women when they have an MI. Um, but luckily for women, men are usually the ones that get MI. So it's a, it's more of a, it's disproportionately male when they get heart attacks. And when they do, you get that crushing chest pain. It radiates to the back and then it radiates down the arm, right? Coupled with nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis, you get sweaty, etc. And then you want to definitely get an EKG. What are the enzymes that we test for? Remember? Proponin, CKMB, right? Other things that you can see with referred pain, liver and gallbladder, uh, you might get uh, pain to the shoulder, right? That would be one example. So if you had like cholecystitis, right? If you have cholecystitis inflammation of the gallbladder, that's the type of referred pain you might see. The appendix, right lower quadrant, you're going to see pain. Um, sometimes with the appendicitis, it starts periumbilical, and then it slowly migrates down to the right lower quadrant. So you can actually see the pain, the referred pain moving in that process. But yeah, it's a good chart. Kind of summarizes some of the things that you might see in terms of referred pain. Phantom limb pain, unfortunately, that's a really, uh, you know, it's an unfortunate consequence of losing a limb. You can still feel sensation from that lost limb. There's been some interesting treatments for that. Uh, they do a thing like mirror, I think it's called mirror therapy. Well, they'll have, they'll make the person think that they're looking at their leg and then they'll have them flex, but they're actually looking at their other leg through the mirror. And so it tricks the brain to think that they still have that appendage, right? And so they're able to like manipulate the nerves and the muscles so that you can try to treat this phantom limb pain. There's other medications that can be used for that as well, but yeah, it's a, it's a pretty interesting, interesting consequence of yeah. amputation. Fever and chills. Man, I didn't have to sound loud enough. I want to hear that again. Dang it. All right, well, whatever. <laughs> you get the idea, right? <laughs> cool. All right, so temper temperature control. You guys know this reference? I hope you do, yeah. Have you guys seen Spinal Tap? Anyone in here? One person. No, the movie Spinal Tap. So I always pull up Spinal Tap when I'm talking about like signal amplification. I have the thing where he's like, oh, it goes up to 11. And none of my students ever seen that movie. So I feel like an old guy just like bringing up ancient references to funny films from the 70s. But anyways, uh, yeah, that's pretty epic stuff with uh, <laughs> the cowbell. Anyways, uh, so fever, right? Fever and chills. Are fevers good? They can be good. They can be bad too, right? Because if you get a fever that's really high, like 106 and above, that can kill you, right? So a fever is good within a certain limit. Why is it good to have a fever? What? One of the major things is that back certain like infectious agents don't like temperatures that are above body temperature, right? So it can actually reduce the rep uh, reproduction of certain types of bacteria, or it could just outright kill certain types of bacteria, right? Because back, a lot of the bacteria that affects us they like body temperature, like 38 degrees Celsius, 98, whatever degrees Fahrenheit, right? So body temperature is ideal environmental condition for some bacteria to grow. Once you get too hot, the bacteria doesn't like it anymore, so they stop growing. Right? So fever can be a good thing. It's going to be moderated by the hypothalamus, right? And then when the hypothalamus gets activated, it can do all sorts of different things. It can result, if, it's, if you're too cold, then you get... Uh, the hypothalamus will allow for increased heat production. You can get increase in your basic metabolic rate by releasing, for example, thyroid hormone, right? If a person is hyper hyperthyroid, generally they're going to get really hot, right? They're also going to get a little anxious because it's, you know, it increases their metabolism. As opposed to hypothyroidism, they're generally going to be a little bit colder. BMR, that's basic metabolic rate, and you get sympathetic uh, nerve stimulation as well. Um, you can get skeletal muscle, of course, involved for shivering. That helps to bring up heat. Um, you can also get uh, vasoconstriction. Uh, <clears throat> vasoconstriction is going to uh, allow for conservation of heat um, <clears throat> to certain areas. So you get 
selective vasoconstriction and vasodilation, depending on what organ systems you want to bring more blood to so that you can increase the heat in those regions. Um, and then if you did get heat loss, it's going to, of course, just through physics of radiation, uh, con uh, conduction and convection, et cetera. So a real fever is going to be considered uh, above 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And when I said 38 degrees, uh, 37 degrees is body temperature. I'm not really good at Celsius. <laughs> I'm an American, okay? So, sorry. Fahrenheit, so 104 degrees. Sometimes you'll hear, hear some people say, oh, they have a low-grade fever. That's a really weird thing to say. That's, a lot of people kind of shun that because there's not really a low grade. You either have a fever or you don't. So once you get to 104 and above, that is when you start becoming febrile, okay? So that's when you're actually technically having a fever. Um, and the, this is the biggest thing, inhospitable environment for invading pathogens, right? Certain bacteria and even viruses are not going to really like the higher temperatures. These are the most important uh, pyrogens that, are gonna, you know, that you are responsible for. So interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha are going to be extremely important in uh, developing a fever. Now... Other things that are also important, so PGE, that's prostaglandin E2. Remember prostaglandins? That's one of the things that allows for paracrine effects to local cells. Prostaglandins moderate, uh, mediate pain as well as temperature for the most part. Mm. So these are all really important, right? So you can kill organisms with that, but of course, uh, you can also kill yourself with a high fever, too, so that can, it can go out of hand. Um, the reason why I highlighted iron is because a lot of bacteria love iron, right? They thrive off of iron. Um, if you were to culture bacteria, for example, on a plate, if you were to do it on a blood auger or even a chocolate auger, those are all made up of blood. And so bacteria really like to grow in those types of environments. If you deprive... Um, bacteria with, from iron, you're going to make, make it harder for them to survive. Another thing that fever can do, it can help with like breakdown, right, and destruction of cells if need be. And then interferon is going to be one of the most important cytokines involved in viral infections, right? It interferes with viruses. <clears throat> so let's talk about sepsis. So sepsis is a very severe condition where basically you have a pathogen entering into the bloodstream. What does sepsis involve? What kind of organisms? Bacteria, good. Does it only involve bacteria? You can get fungi too. Yeah, so actually, here's a fun story. Um, when I was working in internal medicine, we had, a, um, we had a patient. She was mostly a psychiatric patient, to be honest with you. And she... Uh, had a condition called uh, Munchausen's disorder. You guys familiar with Munchausen's? What is Munchausen's? It's not just convincing yourself that you're sick. It's pretending that you're sick so that you can gain attention from people and sympathy. It's like sympathy points, right? So you get attention from your friends, relatives, doctors, nurses, etc. And then there's another condition that's even worse. It's Munchausen by proxy, which involves what? <laughs> Yeah, doing that to someone else, oftentimes a child. Yeah, so you have some sick, deranged parent that, like, forces their kid to be, like, a sick person so that they can, by proxy, get the attention and sympathy that they seek. So pretty scary stuff. So this chick had Munchausen, and she uh, eventually developed sepsis from Candida albicans. How do you think she got that? you probably wouldn't even be able to guess. So she, and, and it took a while for us to figure out what the hell happened. She was spitting in her IV line. <laughs> and like candida lives in your mouth, also in like the vaginal mucosa too. But she was spitting in her IV line, and it got to the point, did the lights just go out? Weird, man. That's probably her ghost like haunting <laughs> us right now. <laughs> so she was spitting in her, oh, I'll just leave it off. She was spitting in her IV line, and then eventually the candida, uh, she became septic, it caused a uh, creative vegetation in her heart valves. And over a course of a couple days, one of the vegetations threw off and became a septic embolus. 
it went to her brain. She got a stroke and she died. So, yeah, you can get sepsis, not just from bacteria, but you can also get it from candida, albicans, so you can get it from fungus. So long story short, don't spit in your IV line, okay? <laughs> There's better ways to get attention than making yourself sick like that. It's kind of crazy. So sepsis is extremely serious. You're going to see this often in, in uh, the hospital settings. It's not always fatal. You can often treat, like, for instance, a uh, personal story. My wife had sepsis last year. She had a GI issue, and it was horrible. She was in the hospital for 10 days. So I would come to work here. I would go to work at the nursing school that I was teaching at. I would come home. I would get my stuff, and I would sleep at the hospital so I could be with her. So <laughs> 10 days she was in the hospital. Then she got released from the hospital. Uh, she had enterococcus faecalis, which is from the GI tract. It got into her blood. She was on a pick line for 14 days. Thank God she survived, but it was really, really scary because sepsis, especially with an organism like that, that one can actually cause heart veg uh, valve vegetation as well. And uh, they did the, uh, uh, they did the um, echocardiogram, no vegetations. Thank God the back antibiotics were enough to be able to help her resolve the issue. So scary situation. Other people might get sepsis commonly from pneumonia. Pneumonia is a really common theme, right? And uh, st uh, streptococcus pneumonia is uh, the most common cause of pneumonia. There's other organisms that cause pneumonia too, but streptococcus pneumonia is the most common. Um, urinary tract infections, right? Remember, those, those are like the two most common nosocomial infections that you get in a hospital, right? So you can get it from all sorts of different things, right? So pretty scary stuff. This is even scarier. A lot of times you don't even know where it's coming from. The person might be septic. You're like, ah, wow, don't know. You have an infection. Don't know where it originated from, but we're going to have to treat it regardless. But these are all uh, different types of super antigens. These make infections even scarier, right? Um, this one is especially uh, staphylococcus, the toxic shock syndrome. So how do you get toxic shock syndrome? There's two ways you can get it. The one is the most common way. There's another way that you can get it, too. Yeah, exactly. So if you forgot a tampon was in there, that can become toxic shock syndrome. Um, the other way that's kind of funny is that if you have a nosebleed, sometimes people pack their nose with, like, gauze and, like, stuff. That can actually cause toxic shock as well. Because where does Staph aureus live? Staph aureus loves to live in the anterior nares, right, in your nose. So for all your, the nose pickers out there, wash your hands when you pick your nose because there's a lot of staph aureus there. And so if you pack your nose for too long, that can actually result in, in toxic shock as well. So not all staph aureus will create that, though. There's different serotypes that have different types of, like, you know, antigens and stuff that they'll create. Just there's certain serotypes that, co that create toxic shock toxin. Exfoliating, that's another really scary one, especially for, uh, for kids, right? Kids will often, like little child, uh, children will get that often on their buttocks. So it's, uh, it causes exfoliation of the skin, right? So like the top layer of the epidermis starts to slough off. It's kind of like, a, uh, it looks kind of like a sunburn a little bit. Um, and then, uh, yeah, pyrogenic exotoxin that causes shock. So shock is probably the worst consequence of sepsis. If you go into septic shock, that's a really bad sign, right? What happens when a person undergoes shock? What happens to their blood pressure? It drops dramatically, right? Why is it dropping? What's happening to their blood vessels? Vasodilation, right? So you're getting systemic vasodilation, blood pressure drops. What's going to happen to the heart as a consequence of the blood pressure dropping? You get tachycardia, right? Because the heart is trying really hard to get enough blood to different parts of the uh, body, especially to the brain, right? So toxic shock is scary because it's systemic, and it's going to cause cardiac arrhythmia, and the person can decompress very rapidly as a consequence. So um, it's good to know also the symptoms of sepsis, right? So fever, shivers, things like that. Um, the person can be generally discomfort, uh, in general discomfort, not always pain. Um, they might look kind of dusky and pale, tired, right, confused. They might feel like they're dying. Sometimes it's because they are dying, right? Um, shortness of breath, so pretty scary stuff. Main bacteria, right? So pneumonia, of course. So streptococcus, uh, streptococcus pneumoniae. 
also staphylococcus, also E. coli, right? Think about UTIs. E. coli is the number one cause of UTIs. So those can all result in uh, sepsis. Indwelling catheters, fungi, as I mentioned, it's not just bacteria. It can be fung fungus as well. So any sort of infectious agent can result in sepsis, not just bacteria. Um, scary thing is, of course, all those exotoxins, right? Those are like virulence factors that make the organism much more intense. Some of the most important ones uh, will be uh, coming from these guys, Staph aureus and Streptococcus pyogenes. What does Streptococcus pyogenes cause? What kind of infections does Streptopyogenes cause? What's the main one? No, that's Haemophilus influenza. That's the most common cause of middle ear infections. Strep pyogenes, main cause of strep throat. Okay, strep throat, but also other things too. You can get necrotizing fasciitis. That's one of the major causes of necrotizing fasciitis. It's literally killing your skin, killing your tissues, oftentimes requires amputation. So pretty nasty bug. That's uh, one of the most severe ones of them all. Um, cool. Super antigens, uh, of course, you can get a severe reaction to that, right? Um, you can get uh, these pro-inflammatory cytokines as a consequence that might potentially cause a, uh, what's it called, like a cytokine storm as a result. But anyways, long story short, sepsis, sign and uh, symptoms, you get fever, tachycardia, right? Tachycardia because generally when you're in pain and if you have an infection, your heart rate is going to go up. Okay. Same thing with your respiratory rate. It can also go up, too. So you can get tachypnea. Right? Tachypnea is the fancy word for elevated respiratory rate. Halor means uh, hail. Right? What's AMS? Altered mental status. Awesome. And then hypotension if you have to toxic shock. Uh, what's DIC? DIC. Death is coming. <laughs> That's the, that's the funny word for it, but the, the, the real term is disseminated intravascular coagulation, right? So really bad situation. When you get DIC, uh, chances of survival are extremely low. And then ARDS, yeah, good. Acute respiratory distress syndrome. Those would be some more severe consequences of toxic shock. So you want to do a CBC, right? Complete blood count. You want to check out what their platelet levels are because you might see uh, uh, effects on platelets. You, of course, want to see what kind of leukocytes are involved. If it's neutrophils, then you're thinking bacterial infection. If it's eosinophils, you're thinking histamine. Just kidding. You're thinking parasites. Uh, if it's uh, uh, lymphocytes, could be a viral type of infection. Um, and then you want to check out your arterial blood gases, right? So your ABGs are going to be really important, so you can assess for things like acidosis, so urinalysis, all that stuff. So just know your major uh, cytokines, IL-1, IL-6, TN, uh, tumor necrosis factor. The vasodilation, that's going to be mostly mediated by nitrous oxide, right? Nitrous oxide is going to be the principal vasodilator, especially in this type of infection. Um, vasopressin. Vasopressin uh, can cause vasoconstriction. So you could theoretically treat a person that's undergoing shock with vasopressin, right? That would be one thing. Of course, you want to give the patient antibiotics and IV fluids. And uh, if it's something involving the respiratory tract, you might want to be able to uh, intubate the patient and get them out of ventilation uh, as well. So this is uh, another really good chart that breaks down the severity, the levels of severity, right? So you can see uh, a person might be febrile, right? They might have a high fever. They're usually going to have a high fever. But if they go the opposite direction, if they're becoming hypothermic, that's a really bad sign. That really means that that person is on their way uh, to total decompensation. So that's one thing to look out for when it comes to uh, the temperature. Um, generally, the heart rate is going to be um, elevated. They're going to be tachycardic, so it's above 100 beats per minute. It's kypnic as well, and they're going to have a leukocyte count that's going to be uh, uh, outside the range of normal. You could see 
leukocytosis, or you could even see leukopenia too, if those leukocytes are being consumed up uh, fast enough. Um, organ dysfunction. If you have really severe sepsis, there's going to be uh, end organ damage. And so, what's the question? Uh, two or more. Let me double check that for you. I think it's two or more. So I'll double check that for you. But organ dysfunction, how do we uh, measure organ dysfunction? Let me look that up real quick. So shout it out if you want, if you want to shout it out. How would you? Depends on what? Oh, do you say it depends on the hospital for service, to meet service criteria? Any two, so two or more. So how would you measure uh, organ dysfunction? Huh? You can see enzymes in the blood, right, exactly. So if you have liver damage, you might see elevated liver enzymes. What about kidneys, renal function? What's a test for kidney function? Huh? Yeah, you could do a urinalysis, and then you could check the BUN to creatinine ratio. So if you have uh, changes in B, uh, BUN to creatinine, that could indicate that there's some sort of like kidney damage as a result. So uh, there's different types of tests that you could run, check out for uh, if organs are being affected. Um, septic shock, of course, is sepsis plus shock. And then if you have multiple organ dysfunction, uh, if you had evidence that the liver was being damaged, evidence that the kidney was failing, then you would be able to qualify for that. And then these are the gradations of severity, right? So you have SIRS, right? And then sepsis is the next step. Then septic shock, right? When you have hypotension despite uh, fluids. And then multiple organ dysfunction. Each of these, though, it's important to keep note. Each of these is a scary situation, right? Just because MODS is more, more of a serious uh, consequence of sepsis, any of these are going to be scary, right? You want to treat that patient aggressively with antibiotics. You want to get, give them IV fluid so that prevents them from getting shock. So all scary. Toxic shock syndrome. So we'll go into that briefly here. Um, group A beta hemolytic strep. So I have always hate the Lancefield <laughs> uh, classifications because group A beta hemolytic is also... Uh, group B, beta hemolytic. Do you guys know which one GBS is? It's important for those of you who are going to go into obstetrics. When you're, when you're working with uh, labor and delivery, you want to uh, test mom for GBS. So that's uh, streptococcus um, agalactiae. And it's, I think it's about 40, it's 25 to 40 percent of women naturally have that as part of their uh, vaginal and anal mucosa. And so if that gets transferred to the child during labor and delivery, that can cause the child to get uh, meningitis and sepsis as well. So you want to treat the mom with antibiotics before she delivers the child. But group A beta hemolytic strep is uh, very, you know, it's very deadly, right? There's a lot of different diseases that can be caused by uh, GAS, um, including toxic shock syndrome. Staph aureus can also cause toxic shock syndrome. So both of these organisms are the principal organisms for toxic shock. Um, yeah, so mostly it's going to be due to tampon retention. Uh, I didn't put in there the packing of the nose, but that can also happen as well. Um, sponges, right, so contraceptive sponges, things like that. If you leave things in there for too long, you know, that can be a scary situation. So high fever, hypotension. So it's a pretty severe uh, you know, it's a pretty severe disorder that can definitely lead the patient to uh, decompensate rapidly. So it's pretty scary. And these are all the different symptoms, right? Lethargy, right? Nausea, vomiting, things like that. Very high fever. You can get diarrhea as a consequence. So cool. Let's go ahead and wrap this one up. And just a couple questions for you from this section.
All right, just one more person. All right, if you weren't able to log in, you should still be able to log in once it hits start, so let's get into it. All right, good. Most of you guys got that correct. So IL-1, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor. Those are the most important cytokines involved in fever. <laughs> I okay, so actually I just fixed it. <laughs> I just fixed it on my end. I was hoping that I was going to fix uh, transfer on there, uh, but we started it already. So yeah, which one is the most concerning of all these? And you're supposed to hit all of them. So I rewrote it. So next time you access this, if you want to go over them again, you should see the update that I just made right now. <laughs> so yeah, so it's a trick question. Every single one of these are concerning. So. Sorry, I messed that one up. All right. All right, hypotension. That's that's the main one. Not hypertension, okay? Hypotension. So when they go into shock, that means you get vasodilation, blood pressure drops precipitously. So hypotension, the opposite. So cool. That was it. And yes, I do want to end. Let me close that out. Let's go on to the next part. All right, so we're going to talk about fluid imbalances. Um, the reason why I include images like this, lymph, uh, lymphedema, uh, it has to do with fluid imbalances, but mostly to do with the lymphatic system. But I think it's, uh, it you know, gives you a good uh, you know, gauge of how bad things can get when you have swelling that's difficult to control. Uh, generally speaking, Lymphedema is going to be caused by obstructions of lymphatic vessels. Um, oftentimes, that can happen to people with cancer. Right? So cancer gets lodged into a, a lymph node. Uh, the lymph nodes, when they're removed, now you have no way for that lymph to be able to get back to the heart. Right? So uh, patients with breast cancer, and if they have to get a radical mastectomy, part of that involves removing the breast, right? sometimes a little bit of the underlying muscle as well, the pectoralis and also the axillary lymph nodes. A lot of those women, unfortunately, have a really hard time getting lymph uh, out of their arms. So they have to wear compression garments. Sometimes they have to massage it out. So it's really unfortunate. You also see that in lower extremities too. Um, the scariest ones are the ones that involve uh, a, uh, a, pa a parasite called filariasis. 
So there's a parasite. It's uh, the it's Wircheria bancrofti is the name of it. If you look it up online, you'll see so many horrifying images of people with like, basically their legs look like all that, right? And it's, how do you think it's transmitted? How do you think people get it? It's usually in like parts of Africa and stuff like that. What's a, what's a, a really, yeah, mosquito bites, yeah. So it's actually due to a mosquito bite. That's how people get filariasis. So pretty scary stuff. Um, I'm not exactly sure how these uh, cases developed, but pretty scary stuff when it comes to lymph, lymphadenopathy, lymphedema, et cetera. So edema in general is a blanket term, right? It just means swelling of some sort. Um, it could be lymphedema, or it could be edema due to uh, congestive heart failure, right? Um, if you have congestive heart failure, what kind of edema do you think you're going to have? Uh, if it's left-sided congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema. If it's right-sided heart failure, you get pitting edema, right? So is it bilateral? Is it both sides? It would be both sides, right? Yeah, because both, both, both legs are going to have a pooling of uh, blood or a backup of, venous, uh, of blood from the venous system. So that's going to cause bilateral uh, edema. Um, hormones can also be involved in uh, the regulation of fluids, right? What are some examples of hormones that are really, uh, involved in that? Yeah, so antidiuretic hormone, what else? Aldosterone, great, those are some really great examples. So speaking of ADH, um, these are a couple diseases that we're going to talk about a lot in this uh, section. So SIADH, so that's syndrome of inappropriate ADH, and diabetes insipidus. So with diabetes insipidus, you get a uh, increased concentration of solutes in the body, so you feel really thirsty, you have to pee a lot. Um, with SIADH, you're doing the opposite. You're releasing way too much ADH, and so you're retaining too many fluids. And then all these conditions over here that are involving um, ions, each of those are going to have different types of presentations, right? So if you have too much sodium versus too little, you're going to have different symptoms, calcium and potassium as well. Those are all going to have different symptoms, which we're going to talk about uh, throughout the course of this portion of the lecture. So total body water. Um, <clears throat> most of your body water is going to be found uh, intracellularly, so within the cells. Right? That's where the majority of water is going to be. And you're also going to find a portion of your body water in the extracellular space as well. So, um, but ICF, the intracellular space, that's where you have the majority of your water. Okay? Um, you also are going to see uh, water accumulation in lymph, right? And you're going to see water a lot in your plasma and as well as in, in your interstitial fluids. Okay, so those are going to be really important spots where you're going to have a lot of water. Don't worry about what else. I'm not going to test you on that for now. Um, here's another breakdown of what's going on over here. Plasma. Right? Plasma is part of your humoral system. Right? Plasma is going to be mostly made up of water. You're also going to have some really important proteins in there. What's the most important protein that's going to be in plasma? Albumin. Great. So albumin is going to be able to help maintaining oncotic pressure. It's going to allow fluids to be drawn back into the circulatory system. Right? Whatever doesn't gets filtered into the uh, extracellular space or the interstitial space rather, sorry, interstitial, and then that gets funneled into the lymphatic system. Um, the interstitial space should not have albumin in it. Sometimes you might find albumin in the uh, in interstitial space in cases of like burns, right? So if a person burns, you get this like massive increase in vascular permeability, you get a fluid shift, right? Fluid moves from different compartments, and then you start getting leakage, right? So you get leaky vessels, and sometimes you can see movement of albumin as well. All right, diffusion versus osmosis. This is going back to some basic biology, right? So diffusion, straightforward. You're just going from a higher concentration down to a lower concentration, okay? And then osmosis is uh, in terms of uh, a higher concentration of water in one area versus a lower concentration of water in the other, and that's going to be driven by tonicity as well as osmolarity, right? So if you have a super, um, if you have a high 
osmolarity, then there's a lot of solutes in there. And then because of osmosis, water follows solutes. And so water is going to move over into the area that's uh, hypertonic or has a higher osmolarity. So pretty basic stuff. Edema. There's um, different types of edema, right? I already mentioned uh, lymphedema. But if you have edema of the lower extremities, especially due to conditions like CHF, right? If you have congestive heart failure, particularly on the right side, you're going to see pitting edema. And I should have included a chart on the different grades of pitting. There's, a, there's charts out there uh, where you push your fingers down, and then, you, and then when you release, you see how long the little pit lasts, right? Sometimes it might be there for five seconds and then dissipates. Sometimes it can stay there for, like, minutes. So that would be, I think, like, class four pitting edema, something like that. Don't quote me on that. Just You can look up the charts. But uh, my grandmother, when she was alive, she did have congestive heart failure. She had really bad pitting edema. You could literally put, you know, stick your fingers on there, and it would last about couple minutes, three minutes sometimes, right? So that's a really bad congestive heart failure. Um, she had long-standing hypertension. So that's one of the reasons why uh, she had those issues. Um, so some basic fluid mechanics. This is stuff that you went through in uh, part two of anatomy and physiology, but it's important to go over all the terms again. What are the two most important uh, pressures on that list? Of, of all these four, which are the two most important ones? Yes, exactly. It's actually, you can see by the thickness of the arrow. Those are the ones that um, have a disproportionate effect on which way fluids are going to be moving, right? So capillary hydrostatic pressure, when you hear the term hydrostatic, you're going to think pushing, right? So what are some things that could affect hydrostatic pressure? What's something that would increase hydrostatic pressure? The blood pressure, right? Okay, so what would be something that could increase blood pressure? So like vasoconstriction, perhaps. So then like upstream from vasoconstriction, you're going to have increased hydrostatic pressure because all that blood is pulling up, and it's going to start pushing out into the interstitial space. Okay, so that's one good example. So blood pressure would affect capillary hydrostatic pressure. The major thing that affects capillary um, oncotic pressure or osmotic, when we use the terms oncotic, osmotic, I'm going to use them interchangeably for the purpose of this. Um, oncotic generally has to do with proteins only. Osmotic is not just proteins, it's also other solutes. But for the sake of this class, we'll use those interchangeably. So that also works, osmotic pressure. But let's just say COP. Albumin is going to be the major thing that affects capillary osmotic pressure. So if you have hypoalbuminemia, and you don't have enough albumin, you're going to get edema. Uh, specifically, you're going to get ascites. That's like one of the major types of edema. You can see edema in other places too, but you'll see a lot of fluid accumulation within the peritoneum. These other ones are somewhat important, right? So you have your interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure. That's the pressure from the inter interstitial pushing back into the blood vessel. And this one should be negligible. So interstitial fluid osmotic or oncotic pressure, that should be zero because you really shouldn't have albumin in the interstitial space. If he did because of a burn or something like that, then you would see this value changing. But in a healthy person or even in a person with like hypertension or whatever, you're not really going to see that. It's going to be mostly a negligible uh, factor. So to go over all that again, so if you uh, increase your, uh, your capillary hydrostatic pressure, you're going to see things like venous obstruction, fluid retention, et cetera. Um, with capillary osmotic pressure, the main reasons why you'll see uh, those values changing are due to uh, liver cirrhosis, right? Because if you damage your liver, the liver is what produces albumin. So you're not going to have as much um, albumin production. Um, dietary course, remember? Which, which is uh, the one that we're thinking of when it comes to dietary? What's the condition that we talked about the other day? There's two. Which is the, which is the, the kid with the big belly? Yeah, kwashiorkor, right. So kwashiorkor specifically is going to be dealing with uh, this. Um, and then, you, of course, burns. You're going to see a, uh, you're going to see a change uh, fluid shift, and you're going to see leaky vessels after burns. 
Um, you can also see this with kidney disease too. Permeability, histamine. We already talked about that. You need to, if histamine is predominantly going to allow for increased permeability so that leukocytes can move out of the uh, capillaries to get into whatever tissues need to, you know, you need to fight off an infection, as an example. <clears throat> All right. So, why do you tell a heart failure patient or even a patient with hypertension to reduce salt? Yeah, exactly. Because of osmosis, right? Water is going to follow solutes. The more salt intake you have, the more fluid retention you're going to experience. Um, is it great if you're like super dehydrated, just to like, guzzle down like drinking water only? <laughs> it feels great, but in reality, you're actually not going to be absorbing as much. You're going to be urinating a lot more. But it's a little bit. If you're like dehydrated, it's, it's also good to Electrolytes. You want to be able to have some electrolytes in there because then it allows for more uh, water retention. So if you're super dehydrated, definitely consume electrolytes as well. Um, yeah, so good stuff. But yeah, if you want to definitely restrict salt, my grandmother again, uh, she had hypertension. She loved putting salt in her food. So that was uh, something that definitely contributed, contributed to her hypertension as well as her congestive heart failure. So. All those things are things to take into consideration. So I'm not going to go over every single one of the aspects in that chart. That's going to be something that you guys should use as a study guide. So this is how you calculate net filtration, right? So uh, net filtration, you would take your uh, capillary hydrostatic pressure, your interstitial fluid osmotic pressure, and then you would subtract the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure from the capillary osmotic pressure. So that would give you net filtration. Um, that would show you uh, where fluids are moving uh, in the direction towards the interstitial space. Right? So if you have more net filtration, that means you have more fluids going to the interstitium. That means you have more fluids that are going to start entering into the lymphatic system as well as a consequence. And then if you get lymphatic obstruction and you can't drain all that fluids, that's when you get things like lymphedema. <clears throat> if you have decreased oncotic pressure, capillary oncotic pressure, you get edema increased permeability, you also get edema as well, right? So if you have a histamine release, that's why if a, a you know, person has allergies to things like bee stings, right? Part of anaphylactic shock, not only do you go, undergo shock, right? You get vasodilation, but the other thing is you get a lot of swelling. So people that have anaphylaxis, they get swelling of their face, right? So they get angioedema of their lips, their eyes. But then more scary than that, you get swelling of your um, oropharynx as well. So it makes it really hard for you to be able to breathe. Hmm. All right. These are all things that can cause uh, uh, issues in circulation, right? So we talked about necrosis already. Um, we already talked about edema. Now, if you have pulmonary edema due to uh, left-sided heart failure, pulmonary edema is also going to result in hypoxia, right? Because you have so much fluid in the lungs and the alveoli that you're not going to be able to uh, have proper gas exchange at that level. What's up? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. I, if I were to guess, I would imagine you'd get, like, maybe rails. Maybe, probably not Ronchi, because Ronchi, I don't know, you might get wheezing as well. That's a good question. Can you look it up and find out if there's a specific sound uh, on auscultation for pulmonary edema? I don't know off the top of my head. Cerebral edema, uh, if you get swelling of the brain, right, you can get that. Uh, that will cause headaches. Uh, you get all sort of uh, significant consequences as well, coma and death. So, edema is not a good thing. Swelling is not a good thing. Um, trauma is not a good thing either. So, moving on. So, definitely know your left-sided versus right-sided heart failure. Right-sided heart failure, that's going to be systemic, right? Because that's where you're receiving blood from venous return. Which are the major vessels for venous return? Yeah, so inferior, superior vena cava. And so if, uh, if you're not able to drain all that blood, you're going to get like, pooling. It's going to back up, especially into the lower extremities. And you might get bilateral pedal edema as a consequence. Versus left-sided congestive heart failure, 
that's going to be blood backing up into the lungs, and then that's going to cause pulmonary edema. Over time, left-sided heart failure can also turn into right-sided heart failure. So if you have just left-sided heart failure and it's not properly treated, that pulling up of the blood into the lungs is also going to cause excessive strain on the right ventricle, and then the right ventricle will eventually begin to fail as well, and then you'll also get right-sided heart failure as a consequence. <clears throat> and then with ascites, right? Ascites, that is going to be fluid accumulation within the peritoneum. Uh, generally speaking, that has to do with alcoholic liver cirrhosis. You can also, of course, get that from things like hepatitis, right? So hep B, uh, as well as hep C, mostly hep C because hep C generally becomes chronic more so than hep B. Uh, it's like a 20, uh, only 20% of cases of hep B become chronic. Uh, hep C mostly becomes chronic if left untreated. Um, and then you get portal hypertension. The, the hepatic portal system involves multiple different vessels. And uh, if you uh, get blood pulling up from those vessels, the uh, fluids are going to start to leak out. And where they leak is going to be into the peritoneal cavity. And uh, generally, you're going to have to do a peritoneal synthesis. So they'll actually go in there with a needle. They'll be able to pull out all that fluid. If you have cirrhosis, you're going to have to get that done periodically. Um, I don't know how frequent it is. It, I guess it would probably depend on the severity of uh, the cirrhosis, severity of the edema, but not fun. So to test that, you can do the fluid uh, test. So we have a side patient, and I'm going to I mean, looking at that person's belly, it almost seems completely unnecessary to do that test. It's like, yeah, the dude has ascites, obviously, but, you know, <laughs> I guess it's a, a confirmatory test, right? Just make sure that he actually does have ascites, but anyways. <laughs> um, so what would happen with protein deficiency hypoalbuminemia? Okay, you actually work together with this, because I want you guys to, like, start making friends with each other, right? I noticed this in all my classes. People, you all sometimes don't really talk to each other. This is when you make friends in your life, right? During your college years. You, after you, when you turn my age, you don't make friends anymore. <laughs> so go ahead and pair up with uh, maybe two or three people, and then you can go over and answer these questions.
All right, are you guys ready? All right, the first two are easy. The third one's a little bit more tricky. So what's with the first one? Net, net filtration. Really? Hypoalbuminemia. <laughs> so, fil yeah, capillary filtration, that just means uh, more fluid is going to be released out of the capillaries into the interstitial space, right? So if you have less albumin, are you going to get more fluids remaining in the interstitial space, or are you going to have fluids being drawn back into the blood? Yeah, so that means capillary filtration actually goes up, right? No, because if you don't have albumin in your blood, in the plasma, then it's not going to attract water back into the capillary. And so, in other words, the water gets stuck in the interstitial space. Right? And then, when, once it's in the inter interstitial space, it can go into the lymphatics. Right? But lymphatic drainage is very slow. Right? Lymphatic drainage is slow, so it's going to cause edema because you're going to get water built up. That's not considered capillary filtration. If it's going back into the capillaries, that's like basically reabsorption, right? Okay. So when we talk about capillary capillary filtration, we're talking about stuff getting out of the capillaries and staying out of the capillary. Right? Okay. So, cool. So yeah. So it goes up, right? Because you're not attracting your your capillary osmotic pressure now is reduced, and so you're not attracting water back into the capillaries. All right. What about this one? Histamine. Yeah, exactly. You increase the capillary permeability, right? So you're going to get more fluids escaping the blood and then going into the interstitium. Right? Now this one is the tricky one. What's happening with sodium? Because you find sodium everywhere, right? Huh? What'd you say? Yeah, so if you increase the salt in the blood, you're also going to increase the salt in the cells too and the salt in the interstitium and the salt everywhere else, right? So when you increase sodium, inter intercellular uh, saline is going to, or sorry, intercellular uh, uh, sodium levels are probably going to remain similar, about the same, right? Because you have the sodium potassium ATPase. So long as there is ATP production, those pumps are going to maintain that concentration gradient. But the interstitial cells are also going to increase, uh, sorry, the interstitial space and the interstitial fluid is also going to increase its salt content. So you're also going to see water being more attracted to the interstitium. So you're going to get swelling and edema as a consequence. You're not going to have as much fluids returning to the blood just because of the salt. Now, why is that? Because what's the main thing that brings fluids back into the blood? Albumin, right? Not salt. It doesn't matter. Salt is, if you increase the salt, it's going to, you know, it's a very tiny, you know, it's a little tiny charged uh, electrolyte. And so it's going to move everywhere. And so it's going to be, you're going to see an increase in the interstitium. So if we go back to this right here. So look, you see salt, not salt. Uh, you see sodium specifically in the plasma, right? So it's going to be in the plasma, it's just normal. You're also going to see sodium in the interstitial fluid, right? And if you think about why, how capillary osmotic pressure is mostly dictated by albumin, then albumin is still going to be the main factor bringing water back into the blood. But sodium is going to, uh, it's going to disproportionately attract more fluids into the interstitial space. So you're going to get more fluid trapping in the interstitial. Make sense? It's a, conf it's, it's a little complicated, but just know that salt, that's why you get more swelling with salt. Right? It's not because the blood vessels are getting more swollen, it's because the interstitium is swelling. All right, let's move on. Let's see that guy again. <laughs> so water loss. So let's see, hormones that regulate fluid balance, right? We mentioned aldosterone, we mentioned antidiuretic hormone. Those are gonna be really important, right? So aldosterone increases sodium, right? You also lose potassium. Right, so you're gaining sodium, you're losing potassium, that's going to be within the nephrons. And then because water follows solutes, then water is going to be brought back in. It's going to be reabsorbed into the circulatory system. That helps to increase your blood pressure. Right? 
Same thing with antidiuretic hormone, vasopressin. Um, what's the mechanism of ADH? What does it do? You guys remember what it does? The what? Yeah, what's, what's the thing that it does? It like puts something into the collecting ducts, the distal collecting duct as well as the collecting duct. Distal, collect, distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct, huh? Aquaporins, yeah, good. So it starts, it puts aquaporins into the apical side of those cells so that now water can be reabsorbed, right? So now you get more fluid retention. Um, if you have low blood pressure, then um, atrial natriuretic peptide does the opposite. Right? Same thing with brain natriuretic peptide. I really hate that they still call it BNP because it's actually from the ventricle. So it should be VNP. When it was first discovered, it was discovered from porcelain, some, from pigs. They found it in the pig brain. But when, when it comes to actual physiology, it's most important from the vent. It's mostly associated with the ventricle, but the name's still stuck. Regardless, it's going to be involving. Um, uh, uh, sodium, right? And so the opposite, right? So you're going to be absorbing sodium with aldosterone. If AMP and BMP are activated because of like stretch, you're going to try to excrete water. You're going to try to lose as much water as you can. So you're going to be excreting sodium. So this is what's going on here. So if you have increased blood pressure, you have increased blood volume, Right? You want to try to lose some of that blood volume, so you're going to excrete sodium. Water follows salts, and so you have excretion of water as well. Then you ultimately reduce your blood volume, you reduce your blood pressure. Um, and yeah, this is just some simple terminology, hypervolumemia uh, versus hypovolumemia. So those are all really important. But yeah, just know that BNP comes from the ventricles, ANP comes from the atria. All right, the renal... Angiotensin aldosterone system, yay. This one's very fun, right? This is all from section two of your anatomy and physiology, so it's coming back to haunt us again. So renin. Renin is going to be released from uh, the kidneys, right? So renin is going to uh, be released when you detect low blood volume, right? So for example, uh, you're walking along, and a shark comes out of nowhere and bites your leg off, right? And you start hemorrhaging, you're bleeding out. So the low blood volume, the low blood pressure is going to be detected by uh, the kidneys, right? At the juxtaglomerular apparatus and all that. Then you're going to get, as a consequence, uh, uh, renin is going to help to convert angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1, right? Remember, angiotensinogen comes from the liver. It's just floating around. Once renin gets released, then angiotensin, angio, angiotensinogen turns into angiotensin 1. It goes to the lungs, and this is where you have ACE, right? Angiotensin-converting enzyme. You guys heard of ACE inhibitors, right, the drug class? That's exactly what ACE inhibitors do. ACE inhibitors prevent, they prevent this from happening. So it allows for angiotensin 1 just to stay as it is, right? It does not allow it to be converted. So that's why ACE inhibitors like captopril, for example, help to reduce blood pressure by uh, preventing this from taking place. So in the lungs, you get ACE uh, helping uh, angiotensin 1 turn to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a very powerful vasoconstrictor, right? That's why it's called angiotensin, right? It's tensing those blood vessels, right? It's not just doing that, though. It's also doing other things. So it's going to be uh, allowing for... Uh, vasopressin, which allows for the constriction. It's also going to affect thirst. So you're going to get thirsty, so you're going to want to drink more water after your shark attack. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, vasopressin is going to help increase uh, water reabsorption. And then you get vasoconstriction just as a consequence of angiotensin too. The other thing that happens as well is you get aldosterone production. And of course, aldosterone, you're going to now start reabsorbing more salt at the level of the nephrons. And then because of that, water follows solutes, and then so you get increase in blood volume just because of extra, extra water in your blood. So lots of different effects just resulting from uh, activation of the renin, uh, of renin release. Right? Once you release renin, this whole cascade is able to take, take place. So fun stuff.
Um, what's going on with aldosterone? How does aldosterone work? So if you look at the key here, this is going to be the aldosterone pumps. Right? So when you get aldosterone released, this is what aldosterone is doing. It's going to be exchanging sodium for potassium. Right? So that's why when you, when you have increase in aldosterone, you're going to become hypernatremic. You're going to have higher levels of sodium. You're also going to become hypokalemic. So you're going to lose a lot of potassium. Um, what's going to happen to blood volume? Up or down? Up, good. What's going to happen to blood pressure? Up. What's going to happen to urine output? It's going to what? It's going to go down. Yes, exactly. It's going to go down. It's water follows solutes, right? So the more sodium you're absorbing, water is going to preferentially follow so sodium. ADH and vasopressin, as I mentioned, it's going to be involving these little things over here, the aquaporins, right? The aquaporins are going to allow for reabsorption of water, right? And so that's the major way that it happens. And it's going to happen preferentially at these two regions of the nephron. Distal convoluted tubule, that's what DCT is, as well as the collecting ducts, that's what CT is. So those are the two major areas where you get aquaporins um, allowing for the reabsorption of water. Um, these are the things that uh, are going to contribute to ADH release. So you're going to see changes in osmolarity, right? So if you see changes in osmolarity, aka if osmolarity goes up, meaning that you have lots of solutes, right? That means you're kind of getting a little dehydrated, then antidiuretic hormone is going to allow for water to be reabsorbed. Now you start diluting your blood, and then your osmolarity starts to go back down. Uh, if your blood pressure is too low, you're also going to see uh, ADH being released as a consequence, too. All right. If you're well hydrated, little ADH is going to be released, right? Because if you're well hydrated, you do not need antidiuretic hormone. You can go ahead and release, uh, you can go ahead and excrete more water, right? So you're going to have diluted urine and a higher volume of urine. If you're dehydrated, however, that's when you get ADH being released. So that's going to be released from the posterior pituitary. What else is released from the posterior pituitary that has nothing to do with this? Oxytocin. Good, yeah. So posterior pituitary, oxytocin, as well as ADH. And then we already answered this question, right? So those are going to be associated with aquaporins. That's what's happening over here. So just no distal convoluted tubule collecting duct. That's where that all takes place. Then you're going to have uh, more concentrated urine. Alcohol. The reason why alcohol uh, makes you pee a lot is because not only are you drinking a lot of fluids, but also it does actually inhibit ADH, which uh, this picture actually depicts very nicely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so without ADH, right, you get more urine, and the osmolarity of the urine is going to go down, right, because of that. So you have less concentrated urine, but it's going to be a lot more volume. That is one of my favorite paintings. I think it's so funny. All right. So let's go through these one by one. What do you think? What's the answer for the first one here? What does aldosterone do? Increases blood pressure. How does it do that? Increase sodium, right? Increases sodium retention, waterfall solutes, increase your blood volume, and so blood pressure goes up. What about Atrial natriuretic peptide. Right. So what does it do? What is it, how does it decrease the... It's in the name. Atrial natriuretic. Nat natriuretic means sodium. Like, like natremia. So you're excreting sodium. So your blood pressure goes down. What about antidiuretic hormone? It's increasing your blood pressure because you're not losing as much fluids, right? So it's, you're going up. Uh, what about brain-derived natriuretic peptide? Decreases. Yep, exactly. Because it does exactly the same thing as atrial natri natriuretic peptide. All right, what about these guys over here? What is, uh, what is aldosterone doing here with, uh, let's see, sodium levels in the blood? It's going to increase sodium. What about AMP and BMP? What does that do to sodium? 
Decrease, good. What about ADH, antidiuretic hormone? So it's going, to, it, uh, it's going to decrease sodium because you're losing sodium, right? Because, uh, shoot, hold on a second. No, actually, you're going to be increasing sodium. So turn that arrow around, my bad. You're going to actually decrease your level of potassium because you're going to be exchanging sodium for potassium. So scratch that, turn that back around. Um, and then hypernatremia versus hyponatremia, that's a, those are the fancy words for changes in sodium. All right, so SIADH versus DI. So SIADH, that's the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone versus diabetes insipidus, okay? What does diabetes mean? What's, what does it actually mean, the word diabetes? Diabetes actually means to pass through. So with diabetes mellitus, mellitus actually means sweet, right? That's the, I think it's from Latin. And so diabetes mellitus means that whatever sweet is passing right through you. Do you know how doctors used to diagnose diabetes on their patients? They would taste the urine. So they do a taste test. Yeah, gross. I wouldn't recommend it, <laughs> but yeah. So diabetes insipidus, I actually forget what insipidus means, but it's water. I think it's water. So it's water passing through. So with diabetes insipidus, you are really thirsty and you pee a lot. It's like about 10 times the amount of normal urine, if I remember correctly. Uh, it's like 12 liters of water a day, of urine a day. Now to put that in comparison, I like to, when I think of liters, I like to think of wine bottles, which is 750 milliliters. It's about like 15 wine bottles of fluid every day. That's a lot of urine. So you're peeing a lot with diabetes. Um, with SIADH, you're getting too much antidiuretic hormone. With DI, you're getting too little, right? So if you have too much antidiuretic hormone, you're not going to pee enough, right? So you're going to be peeing very little. So you, very little urine output. What's the urine osmolarity going to be? Is it dilute or is it concentrated? concentrated. So what happens to the urine osmolarity? It goes up, right? And actually, let me make, make a side note to go ahead and fix that one arrow because that's kind of embarrassing. Uh, the screenshot. There we go. All right, what's going to happen to the serum osmolarity? What's up? That is such a great question. I don't know. Yeah, maybe look it up. <laughs> look it up right now. Let me know. I'm actually, I actually want to know. What happens to the serum osmolarity? Does it go up or down? It's going to be the opposite, right, of the urine osmolarity. So serum osmolarity is going to go down. You're going to retain a lot more water, right? So in other words, your blood and your plasma is going to be more dilute. What about with diabetes insipidus? What's happening with the urine osmolarity? Is it more dilute or concentrate? It's more diluted, so the osmolarity goes down. What about serum osmolarity? The opposite, right? So it's going to go up. So this is what's going on with both of these. So SIADH, a lot of times, you know, us doctors, we're idiots, right? So a lot of times we actually don't know what the heck is going on there. Sometimes it could be due to trauma. Uh, it could be due to cancer. It could be due to certain drugs. Um, did I put it in there? Uh, there's one drug in there that should be in there. I think it's uh, lithium. But thiazide diuretics, right? Thiazide diuretics could cause that. What's up? Did you find it? It does? That was a great question. Yeah, good. Good, good, good stuff. Yeah, I learned stuff from you guys too. So, yeah, it's a two-way street here. Uh, yeah, so certain drugs can cause this, right? Um, clopromide, or chlor chlorpromide can also cause that. Uh, carbamazepine. Antipsychotics. Carbamazepine is a anti-epileptic drug, um, and then of course antipsychotics as well as antidepressants can also cause that too. So there was another one that I was thinking that I should include in here, but never mind. Scratch that. All right. And then in terms of symptoms, you're going to have things like lethargy, confusion, fatigue. Uh, yeah. So the big 
concern here is you have lots of uh, you have lots of fluid volume, right? As a consequence, you're not peeing enough, so you have a lot of fluid retention. Because of all that fluid retention, it's going to cause imbalance of your solutes, right? So you're going to have hyponatremia as a consequence. Because if you have more diluted uh, blood plasma, then that means overall it's going to be equivalent to having low sodium, right? Because relatively speaking, you have too much water, right? And even if you have a normal amount of sodium in your body, just because of all that water, it's going to look diluted. What's going to happen to your heart? What's going to happen to your brain because of that? What happens to your brain? What, what's the main thing that causes depolarization of a neuron? Which solute? Is it sodium or potassium? Sodium, yeah. So if you have too little sodium, right, if, it's, if your blood is diluted and you have too little sodium, that action potential is not really going to be able to be as vigorous. That's why you get lethargy and confusion, right? You get fatigue because you're not able to get as much neuronal stimulation as, as you could otherwise. Um, another thing that could happen, too, you can also get uh, issues with your cardiac myocytes as well, right, because your heart's not going to be able to pump as well because depolarization of your cardiac myocytes also involves um, sodium plus calcium, too. But um, Urine osmolarity is going to be really concentrated, right? So it's going to be really high, okay? So you have low uh, volume, and you can treat uh, this disorder with drugs that uh, counteract this, so ADH receptor antagonist, or antagonists. Diabetes insipidus, it's going to be the opposite. You have low antidiuretic hormone, right? The cause is kind of interesting, right, because you uh, could have a pituitary tumor, uh, renal damage, also certain meds could cause that. And because uh, you have, um, you're peeing a lot, you're also going to be extremely thirsty as a consequence, right? So your osmolarity of the uh, serum, you're going to have very concentrated uh, serum, right? So it's going to have a lot, more, a lot more solutes as a consequence. Uh, serum osmolarity goes up, and then urine osmolarity goes down. Here's a table that I included that talks about um, some of the different things that are involved that can cause these conditions, right? So you had those thiazide uh, type of diuretics, furosemide can do it, um, antidepressants. So any of these um, SSRIs can cause that, antipsychotics, right? So there's a lot of different drugs that can result in uh, hyponatremia through, the, through SIADH. By the way, you're not responsible to know all the different drugs on this list. I just put this on here just for your information. Uh, Paraneoplastic uh, syndrome. That's going to be involving cancer, right? So it's going to be involving cancer. Uh, you might see this affecting things like calcium. So you might see uh, hypercalcemia, right? So uh, increased amounts of calcium in your body. And you can also see SIADH as a consequence, mostly due to small cell cancer. So know that uh, cancers can cause these types of disorders, too. All right. In terms of uh, diabetes insipidus, just think very thirsty and you're urinating very frequently. Right? You don't have um, antidiuretic hormone because you don't have antidiuretic hormone. You're just peeing a lot. Right? You're not able to bring in all of that uh, extra fluids, uh, brain tumors, right? Um, hypophysectomy. Why would you get? Why would somebody get a hypophysectomy? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you have a pituitary adenoma, if you have like a prolactinoma, which is one of the more common ones, if you have a pituitary adenoma, they go in there and they will remove the pituitary gland. And so if you remove the pituitary gland, you're not going to be able to produce uh, antidiuretic hormone. So that's going to be a direct uh, consequence of that. What's up? They would have to supplement the hormones. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you'd be on lifetime hormone replacement therapy, unfortunately. And then, so these are neurogenic causes. The other ones are going to be nephrogenic causes. So if you have a nephrogenic cause, it could be due to a bunch of different things, right? So they're not responding to ADH in the kidneys. Um, pyelonephritis. It's funny. I was getting my teeth done uh, at uh, Midwestern, 
and one of the students that was helping me with my cavity had a couple issues. Uh, he had to take the, the week off because he had pyelonephritis. What's pyelonephritis? It's an infection of the kidney itself, right? Usually it starts with a UTI. You don't treat the UTI, and eventually it makes its way all the way up to the level of the kidney. So we're going to learn about all that later on in the semester when we get into uh, 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 nephropathies and stuff like that. Uh, what about uh, PKD? What's PKD? Not on there. Huh? Yeah, it's something kidney disease. So it's polycystic kidney disease. Uh, we're going to talk about that later on when we get into uh, different types of genetic disorders. So there's autosomal dominant and there's autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. If you get that, you can get all sorts of different complications. And by the way, those kidneys get huge, like really massive, and completely filled with fluids. Um, in building one, we actually have a bucket of organs, and one of the buckets has a polycystic kidney, which is super cool because it's very, very rare. But if you have that, you might get uh, issues with uh, ADH response, as well as amyloidosis. Amyloidosis uh, it can involve multiple different tissues in your body. Don't worry about that, but it's something that can also cause it. Lithium. Whenever a person has bipolar disorder, this is one of the concerns about like lithium toxicity. They might get diabetes insipidus as a consequence of taking lithium. Um, Colchicin, that's actually for gout. The other one is uh, allopurinol too. Amphotericin B, for those of you who took microbiology, what's amphotericin B for? It's for fungal infections. So itraconazole, fluconazole, amphotericin B, those are the most common ones. But amphotericin B can cause this. Loop diuretics, right, like furosemide as an example. Anesthetics can also do it too. So polyuria, polydipsia, those are the fancy terms. Polyuria, peeing a lot. Polydipsia, drinking a lot. So those are the big things. And here we go. 8 to 12 liters a day compared to just 1 to 2 liters a day. This would be equivalent to like about 2 bottles of wine. <laughs> this is about equivalent to 15 bottles of wine. So a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There's a couple of funny memes online. It's like Americans will use any metric except for like <laughs> the metric system. <laughs> All right. Uh, testing, you can test for the osmolarity, of course. You can check for ADH levels. Uh, you could do CT scans, right, to see if there's like a tu uh, tumor of some sort that's underlying the uh, underlying cause. Right? And so uh, here are a couple more schematics of what you would look like in the presence of too much ADH versus too little ADH. So, all right, moving on. So, what? What's the underlying cause of SIDH versus DI? What's what's the levels of ADH in both of these conditions? So SIDH, is it up or low on the ADH? All right, what about DI? All right, cool. What about urine osmolarity in SIDH? It's going to go up, right, because you're absorbing a lot of the water, right, and so the urine osmolarity becomes very concentrated. What about for DI? Opposite, right, exactly. Serum osmolarity? Yeah, so it's basically the exact opposite for each of these. So pretty fun stuff. So let's talk about dehydration real quick here. We got a little bit over 10 minutes left. So with dehydration, uh, if you don't have enough fluids, you're going to become hypotensive, right? Your blood pressure is going to go down. And uh, because of your blood pressure going down, your heart is going to try to overcompensate for that, right? And so it's going to try really hard to get as much blood as possible pumping through the tissue, so you'll get tachycardia as a result. Um, skin turgor, like whenever you do a physical exam on a patient, um, you know, what you do is you just pinch the skin, and then you see if it tents, right? If it, if it creates a little tent and it stays there for a little bit, they call that increased skin turgor. That just means that the person's dehydrated. Right? They don't have enough fluids in their body. So pretty straightforward stuff. Whoops, let me go back again. Um, urine, yeah, of course, you'd have decreased urine output because your body's trying to uh, preserve water, the osmolarity would go up, 
Increase hematocrit. What does the hematocrit mean again? Yeah, it's a percentage of red blood cells, right? And so if you have an increased percentage of red blood cells, why the hell is that happening? <laughs> because you're dehydrated. <laughs> the ratio is off, yeah, because plasma is made up mostly of water. So if you have not enough water, your plasma goes down. That means your hematocrit is going to look like it's higher. In reality, you have the same number of red blood cells. It's just that you have less plasma. Um, serum osmolarity, of course, goes up. And then you might see a BUN to creatinine ratio. That might indicate that you're getting some sort of issues with the kidneys at that point. All right, so let's do uh, module two, part two. And then, unfortunately, we're going to have to continue the rest next week. All right, cool. So let's go ahead and start. So what did he, what does he not have enough of? Albumin, good. So if you don't have enough albumin, what happens to your capillary osmotic pressure? Capillary osmotic pressure goes down, exactly. So you're not able to bring fluids back into the red blood cells. So that's the opposite of this over here. You, don't, you won't get increased capillary osmotic pressure. And that would not really affect the capillary hydrostatic pressure. What's the thing that affects capillary hydrostatic pressure? Blood pressure, right? So if your heart is beating really fast and hard, or if your blood vessels are dilating and vasoconstricting, that would increase the CHP, capillary hydrostatic pressure, not the presence of albumin. <clears throat> what organs are the root cause of this? I'm sorry, I should have specified that last type of edema <laughs> the last, from the last question. Um, not the heart, right? The heart doesn't make albumin. Kidneys don't make albumin. The liver is what makes the albumin. Okay, so actually I should specify that's pertaining to the last question. Hmm. Bless you.
still again pertaining to that last, uh, the previous patient. <clears throat> so, good, ascites. All right, let's go through this one. This one's a little bit longer. All right, it looks like most of you guys got it correct. A nice and long-winded question, so. <laughs> uh, next. What would excessive alcohol consumption do? It would block ADH, right? That's why you pee a lot when you, when you booze it up. So meds, cancers, and diseases that affect the lungs and brain. Next. All right, good. Most of you guys got that correct. So, yeah, so if you have too much antidiuretic hormone, that means you are going to be retaining a lot of fluids. What's that going to do to your serum? You have a lot of fluids in your serum, it's going to dilute everything else. So, the dilution goes down, that means your osmolarity goes down. So decreased osmolarity, and then the opposite is true for the urine, right? Urine is going to be more concentrated and, uh, yeah, more solids in the urine. Let's do a couple more here. All right, yeah, so if you have diluted urine, or sorry, diluted serum because of too much fluid, all solutes are going to be diluted, right? So you have low sodium as a consequence. You guys got that? 50-50 split. <laughs> all right, one last one, then we can go.
Right. All right. Definitely go over these uh, some more. Okay. So definitely go over these some more. Um, that'll be your homework over the weekend. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. I'll see you next week.